He said, better be in port. Yes, sir. The American agent has infiltrated the X-Lab facility. To the combat footage show on a Tuesday. That's weird. Uh, I'll talk about it here in a second. Do me a favor, hit the like button, drop a comment in the chat uh, because it's Tour de War and we're headed all over the place tonight. Here we go. It's weird. This can has our logo on it. You just barely see that there. That's weird. Hi! They're coming. What's everybody doing? Uh, the like button. Have you forgotten it, people? Uh, well, I haven't. Please do that. That's easy. Easy stuff. It takes for being here. You shut up, battle chemist. Hi from Slovenia. How are you? Uh, welcome in from Denmark. I see it. Uh, we won't make it to 2024. Uh, well... I had... Okay. All right. Interesting. Uh, Oregon, what's up? Lincolnshire, Alabama. Southern Germany, what's going on? So many Canadians. Yeah, they're like multiplying or something. That's weird. Netherlands, I see you. Texas. Romania, what's going on? Hey, welcome back, guys. Uh, let's, let's start to turn this down a little bit. Uh, welcome back. I called it the Tour de War tonight because we're going to kind of be bouncing around a little bit more than normal. Not too much. We'll see footage tonight from Israel, of course. You know, war still continues in Gaza. War has scaled down a little bit in Gaza, but we'll talk about what that means uh, when it's time to get there. Uh, we'll see some footage from Ukraine tonight, but we're also going to check in on what Iran likes to do, um, which uh, just about once a year at this point, they like to send missiles into Iraq. Uh, primarily targeting one thing, but saying it's another, but we'll talk about it. Uh, they also, though, uh, decided to strike into Pakistan. Once again, we'll talk about that, as well as in Syria. We'll talk about the Syria stuff a little bit less. But it's good to see you. Uh, why we're here on a Tuesday is something that I've talked about doing uh, for quite a while. That just makes a little bit of sense to me. Uh, for the longest time, we've been doing Monday and Friday uh, for this show. Friday being a catch-up of or excuse me, the coverage of as much footage as I can pack into about an hour and a half from throughout the week, uh, with Monday being kind of, here's what you missed over the weekend. Well, here's, in my opinion, what the problem with that is. Uh, it's kind of a, it makes for a lopsided show uh, relative to the context that I have. So what I chose to do is keep that two-day block inside of the week, right? Uh, so rather than have, you know, a three-day block gap during the week when most of the footage is going to be released. Um, we'll do it Tuesday and Friday, and we're going to test that for a little while. We will only have two streams this week, so Tuesday and Friday. Uh, there will be a stream Friday, but we won't have any next week. Next week, the Funker team is going to be on ground at SHOT Show. I'm hoping to see some of you guys there. We're looking forward to it. We have a great time when we go You know, each year. Hopefully, I'll see you at the Circle Bar. If you don't know what the Circle Bar is, it's the Circle Bar inside of the Venetian there. That's pretty much where everybody hangs out. Um, and we're excited, you know, uh, it, it can be a little bit of a grind for those that haven't been to SHOT Show in the past, but, you know, it's a good opportunity for us to get out of the house to, to meet people, to integrate a little bit, but let's get started for the show tonight, um, because it's going to, it might take us a little, a little bit of time. The IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps claimed a series of strikes in Iraq. This sent everybody a little bit crazy with claims that the IRGC was striking the U.S. consulate. We kind of held on this for a little while after talking, and not purposefully, I'm not trying to take the high road here, because at first, you know, even behind the scenes, we we're like, holy shit, they're hitting the U.S. consulate. That's a big deal. What we decided to do, do though, is reach out to, you know, some close friends, and they actually reached out to us uh, that most of you guys probably actually know really well that have spent uh, probably more time... Um, in Erbil, 
Iraq than you have spent in your living room. But they reached out to us and said, hey, you know, I wouldn't take, I would take this with a grain of salt right now because every video that I'm seeing doesn't look anything like the U.S. consulate, not even the new U.S. consulate, which we'll talk about here in a second. That's like circa 2021. Uh, it actually looks you know, more like maybe some suburbs on the outskirts or something. Uh, looks like it could be, uh, it just definitely doesn't look like the consulate. So we kind of w withheld uh, really releasing any footage on that, except for one strike. We're going to watch it here in a second. But what you're looking at on your screen is the strike location. Now, this is the home of a billionaire, a Kurdish real estate mogul. It goes by the name of Peshra Desai. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. I'm doing my best. But the strikes, we'll see these strikes here in a second, killed um, himself along with three members of his family to include a one-year-old. Uh, the one-year-old's name was Gina Peshra. Here is the strike coming up for you now. Now, if I understand correctly, they launched a total of four um, Fateh-110 missiles. Fate 110 missiles, Fata 110 missiles. Uh, it's one of their shortest range missiles that they have in their arsenal. And you see two impacting here. I want to say two impacted somewhere else in, in, in Iraq, but I don't know that we necessarily have video of that. There is circulating video that I can't really geolocate or tie to a specific strike. This is the one that I can tie once again to this location, which is that home. Now, here is the some of the footage of those launches as they came from Iran. We've got two videos to look at here. And we'll take a, we're gonna play some Funker Factor Fiction tonight as well. Stand by. Can anyone explain the motives behind the strike? We'll be talking a little bit about that. It's difficult to do, though. <clears throat> talk about claims. And then we'll talk about some historical precedent here in a second. Again, I'm not here to make a call, to make a claim. I'm here to give you the context and, you know, when possible, some historical context that might support some of it. Here is some more on-ground footage of Iran launching those. The IRGC did claim these. Very quickly, too. Now, Iran claimed that what they were striking was, you know, effectively someone that is in bed with Israel uh, and a Mossad headquarters. Uh, but, and, and I'll leave this to you to go and do your research on your own, multiple organizations and, you know, media outlets, again, make the call for yourself, are effectively through their independent investigation reporting back that there is, you know, this guy was a real estate mogul. Uh, there was one claim from Iran that he had something to do with oil. He has never dealt in oil. Uh, he specifically is the CEO of Empire World, if you wanted to take a further dive down that research. Now, back in... On March 13th of 2022, that was the last time that Israel struck into this area, which again is dangerously close. We're about 2.89 kilometer, or excuse me, miles from the U.S. consulate. I'm going to show you that here in a second. But that was the last time they struck into this area, and at that point, they were striking the villa of Baz Karim Barzanji. Uh, they claimed that he had. Um, once again, some relationship to Israel, which again, at that time, it was found that he was Kurdish. 
uh, did not have any relationship to Israel. And it was actually because he was working on a plan uh, specific to gas and the provision of that gas to Turkey and Europe. So they were upset about the gas, said that it was because of Israel, and that's why they were striking him there. Again, recommend doing a little bit of research from a motives perspective. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily take Iran's word for it, just as I wouldn't necessarily recommend taking anybody's word for it. I'm just trying to give you the context that I was able to find uh, in a relatively short time period. Let's take a look at some uh, footage from the aftermath, though. This is going to be released by RT. It's going to show quite a few... Um, like first responder types in the area, if this is the footage I'm expecting it to be. It's still buffering. I'm going to show you some different footage here. This is drone aftermath footage of his house after it was struck. Now, I'm going to pause this at one point here because you're actually looking at the consulate and you don't even know it. 2.8 kilometers down this highway here is going to be the new U.S. consulate. I want to say it's about right here, just after this left turn. So it's about 2.89, 2.9 kilometers away. I'll show that to you on the map here in a second. Wouldn't this be MSR Tampa? Somebody help me with that. It's been a while. Since I, I didn't deploy to Iraq. We just did some scenario-based stuff. That is Tampa? Yeah, okay. Let's see if that other aftermath footage will come up. It sure does. This is from RT. I want one of those. Now, one of the things that comes along with a strike like this, especially when it gets to be, uh, I would still say 2.9 miles or so is, is that's close proximity, uh, is a lot of you know, misinformation, a lot of sharing old footage. We're going to play Funker Factor Fiction because one video is making its way so wide that uh, you know we felt a need to, to send it out again. We covered this back in 2022 when it first came out. Uh, what you're going to see here, is old footage from uh, almost exactly two years ago. And that's ironic. Old footage of a CRAM trying to take down um, a suicide drone. This was shared as being part of the strikes in Erbil, and it is not. Now, what I'm going to show you here is there's actually multiple angles of this in multiple sources. So here is a second source, and you'll note the January 13th, 2022. Uh, and what's interesting about this video here is you're seeing, we just watched the first angle, which this guy is recording, and we are looking at a guy that's standing next to that guy. Now, let's head back to the map, kind of kind of put all, bring everything into perspective for you. So here we are at the strike location here. We were looking to the south earlier. Uh, please start turning. Thank you. So we were looking about this way. So I guess that's west, you know, west by southwest. That is the view that we had from that drone video. If we were to drive down MSR Tampa here, this road... We arrive at the consulate here. This is a new consulate. I want to say 2021, 2022. So when people say it was close to the consulate, they're not lying. It is close. And there was one video that was shared around that, uh, you know, looked like it came from one of the, the, the housing buildings that they have there with sirens going off in the consulate. But just to bring everything full circle, let's do some measurement stuff. And you'll see about 2.9 miles just depends on where i drop this 
So 4.5, 2.8, I'm up, you know, close enough. Very close, but it did not actually target the U.S. consulate. Iran wasn't done, though. Iran decided to strike into both Syria and today, which is, this is relatively new. This might not have even made it into the stream description, into Pakistan. Here is some of that footage immediately following the strikes into Pakistan. I'll bring up on the map where this is in a moment. These were supposedly or reportedly, according to Iran, targeting the, the Jaish al Jaish ul Adl group. Now, th these guys are a um, Sunni Salafi kind of movement in Balochistan uh, that primarily conduct attacks into southeastern Iran, and they do so across border from Pakistan, right where you're looking at here. This is one video, and then. This is the only video that I was able to find for this, for these strikes. Here is immediate aftermath at the strike location. Allahu Akbar, Aswan Allah, name Al Wakil, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Mazabit, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Walillah, Ilham. Don't have a shit chair, I know. Done. All right, coming back up. Sorry. Now, these strikes took place in Panjgor. I think that's how you pronounce it. Let's, let me show you where that is, though. I think it's helpful to understand the location here. Panjgor. Here we go. So this is an, a, a vicinity of, I shouldn't say in Panjgor, but in vicinity of. So you're very close to Afghanistan here. Afghanistan's going to be, you know, immediately to the north. You'll have Iran immediately to the east, and you're in Pakistan down here at the bottom. So very much so in uh, Balochi territory, and uh, definitively a, a location where theoretically Jaish ul Adil would be operating. All right, let's bring it back up because we're going to be shifting into Israel uh, after I pause for a second and check in on the support and thank you guys for it. D-Bag175 for $100, sir. Sir, that's a lot of dollars. Thank you very much for it. Thanks, buddy, for your work. I know it's not easy work you're doing. I wouldn't say it's not easy. Uh, it's tedious, uh, time-consuming, and uh, I think the entire team thinks it's important. Um, but I love doing it, which makes it easy. Right? So thank you very much for the $100, sir. Uh, we appreciate that very much. Logan, thank you very much for the 1032 Ronnie's Truck Fund. Uh, keep up the good work. Thank you for it, sir. And Viking69, thanks for the 628. Christian Stone, welcome to the Funkers. Thanks for hitting the member button. Let's move on to the war in Israel, in Gaza, headed to the Institute for the Study of War. Actually, I might need to refresh this map. Stand by one second. Talk amongst yourselves. Uh, P3, thank you very much for gifting 10 members to everybody watching. Thank you, guys. You guys should now have access to St. Mattis down there in the emotes. I think there's an A-10 in there as well. Those are some leftovers from the old Funker stream days. We will be starting up here in Lebanon, where we've got a little bit of footage of Israelis uh, firing the Israeli version of M109s, which I'm happy to be corrected on this, but I believe they're actually running on top of a Merkava chassis. Somebody correct me on that. I'm not a, I'm not a 
a, a mechanized guy. Uh, but we're also going to see uh, an ATGM strike a Hezbollah ATGM strike that actually ends up killing, I want to say, a mother and her son. Now, what I find interesting about that is these areas in the checkered blue, and this is the reason I wanted to cover this before we got down into the map. These areas that you see in the checkered blue here, these are military zones that Israel has supposedly or reportedly evacuated civilians. You're going to see the same thing down towards Gaza down here. This is the Gaza, quote, military zone. Right? But there's an article, and this is in the thread on Twitter. You'll have a link to that in the stream description. There is an article that speaks specifically to this video and reports that a mother and her son were killed in this ATGM strike that we're going to watch. But first... Here are those Israeli M109s reportedly firing at Lebanese Hezbollah. Sorry about your ears. So you've got some loom rounds here as well. Something to make note of there. We've talked about these before, actually. So these, those little, uh, that's not going to work. Those little, those little yellow, those yellow shells there, those are, those are loom rounds. We watched one of those fly into a courtyard uh, in the way that they work when they, when they're fired out of the, out of the cannon, they separate the, the loom kind of does its thing, but parts of that canister continued to fly and fall. Now, one of those end up, ended up hitting a Palestinian that was standing next to a car, and it just amputated his leg entirely. Just if you uh, didn't recall us having that conversation. But let's check in on that uh, ATGM shot from Hezbollah, Lebanese Hezbollah. Coming up now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep that music off. I've been slapped for like the last four streams for copyright claims. Uh, so just pay attention in the background here. Well, first of all, you can see a little bit of the aftermath of that ATGM strike on the left. But in the background, you're going to see ambulances departing from the area. Exactly where this, where this took place is what interests me the most, though. And I don't have a great geolocation for it. Because again, and I just want to reiterate, if we head back to the map, this is somewhere along the border with Lebanon. But again... Israel has designated this area, which it, in certain instances is miles deep, you know, over two and a half miles at certain points, this area as, uh, you know, effectively a military zone and civilians are supposed to be evacuated from those areas. All right, we're going to head into the West Bank, where, we'll, where we actually have an interesting one that does not include... The IDF, but still shows hostility. We're going to see some footage here of the Palestinian Authority clashing with Hamas supporters because the Palestinian Authority removed a bomb that was meant for the IDF. Pull this video up for you. Uh, this took place, I want to say, in Hebron. Don't quote me on that, though. I don't have a great geolocation for it.
Now, if you're not familiar with the Palestinian Authority, I'm, gonna, I'm only going to speak to this at a surface level because it's, there's depth there here that I don't have. And I'm always a proponent of people not talking about shit they don't understand. Uh, beep. If you're not familiar with the Palestinian Authority, this goes all the way back to like the Oslo Accords, Clinton, Clinton era, Yasser Arafat, etc. Uh, the Palestinian th Authority is effectively comprised of uh, Fatah, Fat Fata? and Hamas was their primary political rival. In Gaza, after elections in the mid-90s, Hamas ended up taking over. Excuse me, uh, mid-2000s. Hamas ended up taking over and there was a large civil war. Since... The Palestinian Authority has really been one of the only organizations that has continued to directly receive aid from the West. There are continued hostilities between the two, between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority. And in fact, uh, you can kind of consider, uh, again, forgive me if I'm, if I'm going down a rabbit hole I just don't understand enough. I'm just trying to help you understand the parts that I do. You can kind of consider Hamas and Fatah uh, you know, Democrats and Republicans. Maybe not necessarily with their reviews, uh, or, or excuse me, views, but they are uh, effectively political parties. Now, when Hamas took over, they wanted a single party in government, and they were also a little bit more hard line than, uh, the, than Fatah was. Um, What's interesting about this one, though, and I have some more footage for us to get into, is the Israel's defense minister. Uh, people have been wondering what's going to be happening in Gaza. Well, the Israeli defense minister, uh, Gallant, said specifically, Gaza will be governed by the Mahmoud Abbas administration, whom is currently the president of the Palestinian Authority, after the war. Just something to think about there. Uh, let's take a look at some more of that footage. That was the longest video, but we got about a 17 second video from on the ground here. Holy shit, what's going on in the gifts? Uh, P3, thank you for gifting 20 and another 20. That's 50 total members to the community. Holy crap there. Thank you for that. Now, a lot of people, a lot of people say, which isn't necessarily untrue, that the Palestinian Authority is kind of under the thumb or being controlled by the IDF right now. So we're going we're gonna to move on from the West Bank, though, because we still need to get into Gaza and southern Israel. Again, that's not something that I have a whole lot of depth for. I'm happy to be corrected on it. You know, you guys know how to reach me on Twitter. Um, it's something that I'm starting to research and look into a little bit more because I think the power dynamic there is an interesting one. Uh, anyway, let's move forward. So we're headed into Gaza. Now, this is where I, I, I mentioned something earlier. Combat power in Gaza with the IDF has just decreased by 25%. What does that mean? Well, the 36th Division has been withdrawn by the IDF, reportedly for uh, rest, R&R, &R, uh, training. Here is a highlight reel that they released on some of the 36th, op 36th Division's operations. I got a lay down of who's left, though. Holy shit. Goodness, guys. D-bag. Oh, I'll respond to that as soon as I'm done here. As soon as we're done with this footage.
Too bad Ronnie's a paved little shill baby. Fight me. Uh, game stream after? Yes, sir. P3, thank you for gifting another 10 members. Wow, guys. The hell's a paved shell? I have no idea. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I've been called worse, though, so it's fine. I'm still waiting on that CIA paycheck that I was supposed to be receiving for, like, the last couple years now. Uh, Demo, thank you for the hundred. You're, you're talking about some jokes you made or something. I'm not tracking what it is, so it couldn't have been that bad because at this point, uh, I feel like everybody would be bitching. But thank you for the 100, sir. Thank you for the, for another 10, P3. Thank you for the $10. Um, Mr. Salty V4. Thank you, guys. This stream is free, all right? Uh, uh, we appreciate the generosity. Thank you very much for it. We're a small team. It, it all helps very much. Uh, all we do ask is that you tap on the like button and drop a comment in the chat. Here is some more from the 36th Division, though. Now, that's going to leave... The 98th Division, which is in Khan Yunus primarily. The 99th, which has got control of kind of central Gaza there, that, that area between Gaza City and Khan Yunus. And then the 167th Division, which is currently taking action in northern Gaza. This is a little ceremony that the 36th had on their way out the door. <laughs> Now the 36th, and we've watched quite a bit of their footage, actually um, you know, all includes the Combat Engineering Corps. Uh, I want to say that the reservist video, I, I can't confirm this, I can't, you know, don't, don't, don't take it 100%. But I want to say that he was a part of the 36th Division. You know the, the um, you know exactly which video I'm talking about. He eats an entire ass grenade and then barrels in and uh, takes out two Hamas. Uh, danger close. I want to say that he was a part of the 36th, but I can't confirm that. But it does include the Golani Brigade. We've seen quite a bit of their footage. One more video from the 36th as they draw. <clears throat> Excuse me. Drive away. Here you are. All right, let's bring it up. Now, in southern Israel, uh, we're technically going to bounce outside of Gaza for a second but then we'll then we'll jump back inside of Gaza um for the for the remainder of the Israel part of the stream but what we're <coughs> excuse me what we're looking for here is uh Neti Vot Neti Vot I'll have to pull that up on Google Earth which I removed the tab for talk amongst yourselves earth we're going to see some Israelis doing some kind of construction work. Nearly killed by an Israeli rocket barrage. See it here, just outside of Gaza. And what I would consider to be southern Israel, right? Israel goes all the way up here. But there. I don't have a geo location for this, but it's being pretty widely reported that that area was subject to a rocket barrage. You're going to see a lot of these getting uh, taken out by the Iron Dome, though.
Hamas rocket barrage, excuse me. If I said Israel rocket barrage, I apologize, and I am corrected. All right, let's bring it up. Uh, Kent, that's a stupid-ass question. There are absolutely stupid questions. Should we pray it continues for more content? This isn't content. This isn't uh, a content show. This is me sharing the footage that we're finding from around the world. Content would be when we take a piece of this footage and we break it down and we bring in outside context and graphics. Uh, there's a reason I don't play music during the show. There's a reason, you know, we don't do subterrain hypes and all that stuff. Uh, this is quite literally, here is footage. Now, if there were no war, which there has never been a time in history of humans that there wasn't some form of conflict, we would quite literally just cover self-defense footage to help everybody understand exactly how to defend themselves uh, and stay alive. But while there is war, we're going to be here to help, hopefully, me understand it. I'm very selfish in that respect. This is really all just for me. If hopefully in the process of me learning about it myself, you can learn some things too. That's dope. But until then, this is what we're doing. So let's move on. We're jumping right back into Gaza here, into Khan Yunus. I've got some uh, official IDF releases here. I want to talk about something before this is over. So, we get a lot of comments. You know, what are they shooting at? They're shooting at ghosts. Well, uh, in a lot of instances, they're not shooting at anything, right? But they're shooting at places where something might be. Uh, it's called suppression. Even a single round, you don't have to have the suppression effect, but that round hitting somewhere in the window there, if there was a dude waiting to peek around it, like this is going to have an effect on whether or not that person chooses to peek outside. We see a lot of the IDF doing that. Uh, but from a justification perspective, that's what he's doing. It's putting around where there might be a guy. Let's bring it up. We've got some stuff from the 98th Division. Again, like I mentioned earlier, the 98th Division primarily operating in Kanyunis in southern Gaza. Official IDF release here. God, that's a terrifying noise. Just think about that. You know what it reminds me of? Reminds me of those Aztec whistles. You ever you ever looked into the Aztec the whistles that they had that sound like a screaming woman? And, you know, when they would be all lined up in the woods, getting ready to, uh, you know, assault an objective or something, they'd all fire off these whistles and it's just a horrifying sound. Google that if you haven't researched it. That's what that reminds me of. Bloop. All right, let's bring it up. Uh, Steel Toad, thank you very much for the five. Uh, thanks, Ronnie, and all the Funk 530 crew. It's important for you guys to share these horrors of war so people can understand, especially nowadays. Um, yeah, I agree. That's what yeah, that's what we're here for. You know, when 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 Funker, myself, Josh, Will, Cam, when we were joining the military, the best thing that we had, uh, which is like my favorite movie ever, was like Private Ryan, Saving Private Ryan. Um, we didn't have this kind of context. It wasn't until 
uh, to be honest with you, the the last couple decades that combat footage, just over the last decade, combat footage has become prevalent enough to, that that the realities of what takes place on the ground are starting to ring in people's ears when they when they see somebody warmongering. Right? I'm not saying that that military action is never something to use because there is there are absolutely going to be circumstances for military action violence is one of the best problem solvers there is it's been used for millennia for a reason right there will always be war but maybe we can understand what that means when we sign up for it now right so understand the cost of that when we are providing aid or when uh, our children want to sign up for war. Again, I am a proponent of the use of military action where warranted. There is not a world that <laughs> that military action can't solve a problem or couldn't be used to solve one where necessary. Thank you very much for the $5. Uh, Iconic Meerkat, thank you for the 737. That's a cool ass name. When's Beard Be Gone Day? You guys actually won't see it at all because I'll still have the beard Friday. And then I'll be at SHOT Show. So unless you're at SHOT Show, if you're at SHOT Show, you'll see me clean shaven uh, begrudgingly. But got a controlled debt for you coming up now. Very little on the geolocation front for Israel. So I have general locations. Let's bring it up guys <laughs> thank you so much uh todd thanks for the 25 sir i really appreciate the work uh you and your team do keep up the great work stay safe everyone i'm just one small part of it one small part of it uh brent uh, one average size part of it brent thank you for the dollar 22 uh check out the kelt carnix warhorn tracking it oh yeah Imagine, imagine being a, imagine being on like Hadrian's Wall or something, just hearing that damn thing blasting. Um, this is an interesting story. It, uh, discretion advised on it. Uh, we're still in Israel, but we're gonna, we're gonna see some footage here of an October seventh survivor and a, a very short version of his story from being one of the survivors of the October 7th attack, I believe, against the festival, the Nova Festival, mm, yes, uh, to eventually becoming a machine gunner in Gaza. Wrong button. Shocker. I'm on the website. So that's why I gave you the discretion, is there were deceased civilians in that. <laughs> Mark, Mark, Mark Orinchuk, sir. No, it's not my birthday, and I told I've I've been telling people this that I eventually I'm gonna be the asshole, and somebody's gonna know shit, think it's my birthday, and maybe. You know, uh, say happy birthday, or even God forbid, send in a couple dollars or something. It's not my birthday. I don't. I don't know where it came from. I don't get it. My birthday's in September. It's in September every year, and has been since I was born. I don't. I don't understand either. So I just want to give you a heads up there. I told y'all. I, I. I told you. All right. 
I got one more video from Gaza before we get into our Ukraine section for the night. We're already we're already getting pretty close here. Um Well When a when a tank is pointing its main gun at you and you try to play peekaboo with it, I don't care what n- nation you come from. I don't care where you were raised. You're going to have a bad time. That's what's going to happen in this video, so discretion is advised. A Merkava, with its main gun pointed that direction, uh, plays chicken with a Hamas fighter with an RPG. The tank is going to win that fight. Here you are, discretion advised. Right here so you can actually just barely make out the kind of a silhouette of something that he's swinging there you can see him kind of take up that take up that stance kind of hard to describe that uh but i think you understand what i'm saying but you could just barely see the silhouette of that rpg here So, that's what I had uh, selected for you guys for the Israel section. Uh, there's plenty more. There's uh, footage on the, the app and website that I didn't cover. There's going to be footage on Twitter, on Telegram, on here on YouTube that I wasn't able to get to. Uh, the stream is really a separate effort from the app and website. I pull from that as often as possible. It's really just me, guys. Um, I'm not going to be able to, t- to to hit on everything. That being said, we're working a couple really cool things for an evolution of this show, wherein, in, in fact, there'll be folks coming in uh, to talk about their own combat footage. These are going to be some stories from around the world, whether it be global war on terror, um, you know, war in Ukraine. And we're really excited about that. The progress is moving along on the studio. Again, it's really just me working on that at the moment. Uh, Everything from production to equipment installation. Um, But we are going to be expanding the stream team by one as an eventuality. That is scale. And it is largely because you guys continue to step back, to jump back into the chat, continue to be generous. uh, And we appreciate that. That allows us to grow, to improve. And I'm really looking forward to it. So that's, you know, kind of a little bit of separating from the footage for a heartfelt thank you. Uh, And I'm really excited about the next steps for it. We're going to, oh, I need to check in on the sport. Goodness. Uh, Leon, thank you for becoming a member. Welcome to the Funker, sir. Jeremy, thank you for the $5. Happy birthday, Ryan. Not my birthday. Uh, Ryan, thank you for the 762. Happy birthday. It's not my birthday. Uh, P3, thank you for the 952. It's always September somewhere in my (laughs) delivery. Fuck you guys. (laughs) Ugh. And I rate Zombie Man. Thank you for the 556. Happy birthday. Okay. All right. Let's get into our Ukraine section of the show tonight because uh, war continues in Ukraine. And we're actually going to start here in Hearson, where I have an FPV strike. Sometimes we just cover footage that's, you know, high quality, right? That you can see clearly what's happening because there's still a propensity to come across footage that's of really low resolution, and that's the situation that we have here. It also boggles my mind that the BM-21 is still something that's actively used by any, by any military. It is a very general, that-away kind of system to use, you know. Um, so each one of these things that is gone, I'm okay with that. Is the plus one a doggy? Uh, well, I have that. I already have a plus two. If that were the case, 
I have two dogs and three cats. But this is the only uh, footage that I had set aside for uh, Hearson. There was some other footage from, you know, the Crinky area, the bridgehead on the, the left bank. Uh, but it was primarily more FPV strikes uh, weren't necessary. We're going to see some more. Um, but it wasn't uh, anything outside of what we haven't seen in the past. Nothing... I don't want to say overly significant because that would be a poor representation of what I'm trying to say. Um, nothing notable, if you will, beyond the already notable fact that it's war footage. So we're going to slide over to Donetsk, and we're going to be talking about Avdivka for a bit. Now I'm going to pull Google. Well, first we'll take a look at Deep State so we can see the forward line of troops. We'll see quite a bit of footage from Stepova, uh, but also from this northern protrusion in the forward line here. Uh, we'll see uh, the loss of, or well, the apparent loss of a Bradley. We're also going to see a Bradley uh, most definitively not lost, uh, just about right here. Uh, we're going to see a really, really gross video tonight from this area that I might direct you guys to the website to watch the rest of. It's just that it's just that nasty. But let's get into the footage that we have here. First, I need to head over to Google Earth. All right, here we are. This is where we're headed to. Right there. Where we're going to see Russians near Avdivka. This is that nasty one. Russians near Avdivka, but, you know, it's really just to the east of Stepova. Uh, I consider this a part of really the same axis, though. One of them is going to get hit by an FPV drone. And I mean hit by it. He's going to survive initially. And he and his... The rest of his three-man team are going to try and unass that location. Uh, he doesn't make it too far, though. There's going to be a point of this that I'm going to stop. And I'm going to give you the link in the chat right now that if you'd like to watch all of it, you can go and do that. But here's the footage. One, I want you to note something. Look at his arm. Here's your FPV drone right here. Look at his arm. FPV drone? Arm. Wait, what was the link? If you didn't get it in the chat, check the stream description. It is the first video under the Donetsk area. So, we're not going to take this video too much further. Uh, but again... The video is in the stream description. His arm has more or less been amputated here, and he is already starting to bleed out. What happens, I'm going to tell you what happens, so you can go and watch it if you want to. Uh, but again, we're not the gore show, we're the war show. Um, what happens from here is uh, he eventually drops to the ground and his buddies leave him behind. So, let's move on from that video. Got one that we will watch all of here, of Bradley. Just absolutely going in on a Russian BMP. It's going to be here. Video is coming up for you guys now. Unfortunately, there's there's music dubbed over the video of this. I'll let you listen to a minute of that. Oh, no. Pretty sure that's Pantera. But if I understand the context behind this appropriately, A, uh, we're, I, I want to say it's Chechens that are recording this, but the Bradley itself is probably from the 47th Brigade. Um, these BMPs, these vehicles, had previously assaulted their position. 
and are now being effectively destroyed by the Bradley and its 25 millimeter Bushmaster so that they can't be recovered. Now, the reason that I think that they are Chechens, I will play that part here in a second, is in two parts. But again, I got to be careful of the copyright problems here. So at about 1.15. Got a little Allahu Akbar there. And then towards the end, it sounds almost like he says, you know, something, something, um, you know, Chechens in his native language. That was a. That was a part of a translation that I came across. an AT4 there in the corner. Okay. Let's bring it up. I put out a tweet earlier and, and I want to kind of explain the, the, the tweet. I did the, I did it from the Funker account. It says something akin to, hey, if you are downrange right now, uh, consider releasing your video raw. And I want to I want to just explain that for a second because first of all, beggars can't be choosers and I'm sitting here comfortably behind a computer screen. But from, you know, just to give you my perspective on that, there are more people than ever that are being exposed to those realities that we talked about. Releasing that footage raw would provide as many senses uh, as possible for the imperfect lens that is video as it stands uh, to understand war, right? With video, you're still really only getting, uh, you know, visual and audio. Uh, there's smell, there's feel that you're not getting from the context of being there. So what you do uh, effectively by dubbing music over top of that combat footage is remove 50% of the audience's capability of understanding what it is that you're going through. Don't shoot the messenger because I'm sure I'm not speaking just for us here. Uh, and we're going to continue to document it regardless of what it has in it. But if you are downrange right now, and I know there are Ukrainians that watch the show, I know there are those in Israel that watch the show, consider releasing your footage raw. That way we can better understand it. Because again, you're going to increase the context available by including that audio by, what would that be, 100%? Just a thought. Let's move on, though. We're staying in Avdivka because we have FPV drone versus tank. This, is, this one's interesting. And it will continue to be interesting no matter how many times we see it. It takes place here, a little bit deeper into the uh, uh, Russian lines. But it takes place there. you got the coke plant here. This will never not be interesting to me because what you have is you have a $500 FPV drone. You know, up against a, I don't know, a multi-million ruble dollar tank. Uh, specifically, it's a T-80 BVM. Now, this is actually going to impact the spare ammunition storage right in the back. And it just incinerates that tank. What tank? That would be a T-80 BVM being operated by Russia. Now, we're kind of jumping around the map here. But we're headed back up towards the north of Evdivka. Here. On that northern axis I talked about. This is going to be a Lancet drone. 
versus what is reported to be an M2 Bradley. It looks like it's parked and more than likely from the 47th Brigade. Don't have, um, I don't think we're provided with a whole lot of aftermath on this one. And that's it. Uh, in the realm of terrifying, we've seen this from a Russian perspective, being on ground and running from drones. Uh, imagine you're, you know, in an open open bed vehicle on the back of it, and you're just you just see the adversary's drones flying at you. Well, here you go. This is a Ukrainian on the back of something. I can't tell if it's like an ATV, maybe a small truck of some kind, but he sees drones come in and he's going to do his best to shoot those. That's a truck. there. Let's bring it up. Staying in Donetsk, though. Oh, d -back. For $50, sir. I'm generous because you're so appreciative. We all are. The in Listen, the, the team is small, right? We are we are proud to be small. We do scale when we're able to. Um, but by and large, the, what keeps us going is, A, you guys being here, and B, your generosity, right? Uh, YouTube does not monetize the streams anymore. They don't, and that's okay. That's just me talking about it. We understand why they don't. Um, but stuff like that is what, you know, helps us continue to scale, hopefully continue to improve. And that's why we're so appreciative of it. It provides me the opportunity to do this, which is what I want to do for a living. And I thank you very much for it. So thank you for the 50, sir. Thank you for the 100 sec. Uh, it's always September somewhere in my delusions. Thank you, P3. Uh, I rate zombie man. Thank you again for the 556, five, sir. And I missed one over here. Patrick, thank you for the $2. Drew, thank you for the 762. Wait, it's your birthday? Fuck. No, it's not, sir. Thank you, though. I uh, appreciate it very much. Uh, thank you guys very much. Uh, anyway, uh, so we're still in Donetsk, but we're going to move over to the Bakhmut area where we're going to see Russian perspective of direct action. It's about a three-minute video uh, the initial report, uh, which I, I don't have a great geolocation for, but the report says specifically that this is a Russian assault uh, storming and capturing a, quote, stronghold uh, somewhere northwest of Bakhmut. We'll take a look at the map shortly after this.
Let's bring it up. Uh, as far as stronghold, I'm not. It looks like maybe a trench line or something. We'll head over to the Bakhmut map and take a look at what Bakhmut looks like. Once I find it, here we go. I always get a little bit turned around. It's Abdivka or Livka. There we go. So here's Bakhmut. I want to say that was somewhere to the northwest, it said. You know, I did look at this earlier, but it's it's really hard to know where exactly that could have been. Uh, could have been anywhere along this line. Right There is forward movement that Deep State's reporting here. Bodanivka. Somewhere around there. All right. Let's bring it up. We got a lot more footage to get through here. Uh, we're going to Dubrovka. Dubrovka, excuse me. Not Dubrovka. Everything's a k. Here. In Luhansk. Where we're going to see more FPV strikes versus a tank. Once again, if you hit it just right, it doesn't matter what the tank is, who made it. These little FPV bastards um, can absolutely destroy your tank. This is a Russian tank. Keeping that music off. I don't remember the explosion being that big. Wow, we wow, wow. Goodness. You can actually see... Well, it takes up the whole screen. You can actually see the drone here as it flies in there. Just got to look very carefully. See it there. But before, you know, we set the precedent tonight that every FPV strike against a tank is just going to obliterate it, there will be footage that we watch tonight of the opposite, the opposite side of that coin. If you don't hit it just right, it's just going to kind of be a, a noise nuisance. But we'll see that here in a little bit. Bring it up. We're going to head to Cremina. Or we'll see some KA-52 footage. Nope, nope. Stupid idiot. Here. So just a little bit to the north. Just to help you understand where we are. Overall. But also on the deep state map. So you can see where that is relative to the forward line. Okay. All right, Deep State. I'm going to need Deep State to make some improvements here. I want to say it's somewhere around in here, in the Crimean area. But it's going to be a KA-52. Firing S-8 missiles towards Ukrainian positions. This is an official Russian, Russian release here. I have no idea what he's saying. Uh, this is an official Russian release here. 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 Uh, this is an official Russian
Uh, also in Cremina. Staying there. This takes place here. So that's really very close to where we just were. We're going to see another tank taken out of the fight. Actually, we just watched that one. I had it logged twice. So we'll move forward from that one. I think we have a drone compilation coming up. We're headed up towards Kupiansk. Uh, discretion's advised on this one. Kupiansk is one of those fronts where, uh, you know, I've talked about that over and over again. It's one of the major offensive areas for, for Russia and has been for quite a while, you know, a few months at least. Ukraine has moved... Uh, really more towards a defensive posture. Uh, Russia has moved towards an offensive posture. They're kind of they're kind of going back and forth. One will will go offensive, gain you know small increments of ground. The other will be in a defensive posture, and it's the it's flipping back and forth. So over over the majority of the summer, we saw we saw Ukraine make a slow but steady progress in Zaporizhia, uh, in Donetsk, in the outskirts of Bakhmut. Now we're seeing that slow uh, and costly but steady progress from Russia in Avdivka, uh, as well as in the Kupiansk area. Here, though, is footage from Aerobomber, Ukrainians uh, dropping in, uh, grenades and such on some of Russia's infantry near Kupiansk. Once again, discretion advised on this one. Took a bullet? No. Uh, it appears as though he took fragmentation from a drone dropped munition. All right. Now, I've, I've talked about drones kind of uh, quite a bit. And, you know, one of the things that I've been researching recently is counter small UAS and some of the programs that the United States has. Uh, that is currently testing and fielding uh, in various states of readiness. And it, it, it includes capabilities exactly like we talked about, you know, a few streams ago. Uh, capabilities that are static uh, slash semi-mobile, mobile capabilities, and then capabilities all the way down to the team level, effectively creating what you would really, ha really have with a, a larger air defense, defense in depth. Right, where you have certain capabilities that are big bubbles and then continuously smaller bubbles until you get down to, you know, man pads, you know, uh, stuff like that. That is really the model that the United States appears to be taking with uh, the the capabilities they're developing. Uh, there's a tweet that I that I've I tweeted it out and I continue to just kind of retweet it every so often that lists some of those. Uh, but what you won't find on that is two things. Uh, shotguns and RPGs. It's not going to work, dog. I mean, if it, it might, 
And that's the same kind of argument with shotguns. Now, I, you know, I'm kind of being a little tongue-in-cheek there. Shotguns can work. Are they the most effective? No. Uh, maximum range you're going to have on some of the best shot with the, great, with the best choke might be 100 meters. So what you're looking at, uh, by the time you're able to orient to that, uh, get, your right, get your shotgun trained on it and take a shot, especially these fast FPV drone types, uh, the chances of you hitting that are very small. Now you can, we're currently working on and hopefully we'll bring to fruition uh, a testing video where, uh, I, I won't get too far down into that. Shotguns can work, but the whole just give everybody shotguns thing is not going to be an overly effective means of combating the, the uh, you know, small FPV drone threat. Maybe hovering drones, um, but unless you're some kind of competition skeet shooter, you're not putting these things down. They're moving in some cases up to 40, 50, 60 miles an hour. Um, uh, you know, uh, I get it. Ducks move that fast too. But by the time it's inside a range, ducks don't have explosives stra strapped to them, right? Ducks aren't coming from behind you uh, with those explosives strapped to them. And if you miss, you die, right? There's, there's context there. There's nuance there. The most effective is going to be a tiered or layered defense posture of some kind, where again, you have fixed, semi-mobile, mobile, and all the way down to the team level capabilities for a layered defense, right? Hopefully you have an RF solution that can jam receivers on these drones. If, you, if that RF solution doesn't work, you might have a man portable solution that might. And again, I need to retweet that, uh, you know, the breakout of all those different drone capabilities because there's even things called the smart shooter, which is an optic that attaches to the top of an M4 that tracks a drone in the sky. And when it finds its perfect, perfect uh, ballistic solution, it fires and it has something like a 9,900% hit rate right now in testing. But again, shotguns aren't on the list and neither are RPGs. Oh, we've got a Russian FPV strike here. That's all I noted for the context on this one. Oh, this is a series of FPV strikes. I do have a location for it. Let's check that. This is in Kupiansk. Just outside of Kupiansk, uh, Petro Pavlivka. Here we are. There. This is where one of those strikes took place. I know everybody in the chat uh, is the, the best shooter that there's ever been. Has been hunting since they were knee high. Good luck. All right. Again, that was a uh, Russian FPV drone compilation here. But we got some more drone stuff. Welcome to the drone war. Welcome to modern warfare, honestly. Um, you know, this isn't a bad tactic. At the last second, here, let's just watch it. Uh, dodge, dip, duck, dive, and dodge. You gotta, you gotta wait until just the last second, though, to make this work. This is a Russian dodging a Ukrainian FPV drone strike. I don't know where exactly this took place in Ukraine, but it is possible at least.
All right, let's bring it back up. Some video, we're in the general section, so I don't have a great location for any of this stuff. Uh, got some video here of the 10th Mountain from Ukraine assaulting a trench line. Coming up for you now. The video is sped up. They're not superhuman speed. We didn't speed it up. We found it this way. That's the music playing on the back side, back end of the video. So you've got, if you couldn't tell by the big blue and yellow thing, uh, Russians here on the right side. There they are. Discretion advised on this one. I want to say things get a little close the further into the video we get. What's the blue mist coming out of the grenade before it ex explodes? What you're seeing is the fuse. Uh, so it's a standard fuse that Soviet-era grenades run. Uh, and he walks up and got close there. Um, and the fuse makes it makes its own small, uh, I, I don't want to say explosion, but there's a pop there and you're seeing the smoke come off of the fuse, which is arming the grenade. Looks like a clip we've seen before. Yeah, the first, when I first reviewed this uh, video, I actually saw that and had to double double check it because I, I thought they might have, uh, you know, inserted in what would be well over a year old clip at this point, but it's not. Uh, it, it is new. It just really looks like it's uh, that same video you and I are both thinking of there. All right. Discretion advised on this one. This one, like, no shit. I'm not kidding. Uh, you're going to see the reality of being inside of one of those, of 
you're going to see two realities of that, both from both sides of a coin here. Uh, the first we're going to watch is a Russian perspective where they all load up inside of, of a van and it starts driving down the road. And then suddenly it just gets hit with an FPV drone and wreaks havoc on the inside. Um, but then we're also going to see the inside of a tank being operated by Ukrainians uh, as it gets hit, hit by an FPV drone strike. So here, first, discretion advised on this, is going to be the Russian perspective of that. So not to, you know, the, the, the car's wobbly in it. That one, that got me. But I want to, I want to talk about something here as we're, as we're watching this before we get up to the strike. So imagine for a second that you've been on the forward line and uh, you're, you're either getting relieved or you're headed back for some hot chow. Uh, put yourself in these shoes, you know, regardless. It doesn't matter if it's Ukrainians that are in the van. It's not. It's Russians. Or if it's Russians in the van. Put yourself in, in these shoes in some kind of a warring context somewhere. So you are now inside of this van in the warmth. You know, shut the window. It's cold as F outside. And then watch this. So just to just kind of break down what's happening here. Not everybody's tracking the different tourniquet types that are out there. Well, you're seeing him apply right now, the orange band there. That's an Esmark tourniquet. It's more or less a rubber band with holes and a pin. And you wrap it around the leg as many times as possible and secure that with a pin. But that is effectively what it is, a heavy-duty rubber band. Now, I don't, I don't see him hit on his leg anywhere. The guy closer, our cameraman, he's definitely... Uh, in pain. I believe it's the cameraman that's screaming, but I don't see this guy hit at all, but he is self-applying that tourniquet. All right. Let's bring it up. So flipping that uh, coin over, if you will, and it's not a direct coin flip because this is going to be a tank uh, piloted by Ukrainians that gets hit by an FPV drone, but it gets hit in an area that it just isn't vulnerable to. Uh, so again, when you see this footage of... I don't know, leopards, uh, you know, Russian tanks even getting hit, you know, dead on by these FPV drones. There's at least some level of likelihood that uh, it just kept on going. 
which is exactly what you're going to see here. This is a Ukrainian T-64 that gets hit by something, and I believe it to be an FPV drone, uh, but keeps on ticking. It's not. Там пробуй. Фу, блядь. Ёба на враг. Фу, нахуй. Просто чётко. Коробочка. Диви, як розірвало їх, і раз нормально, нічого не пробили, підраз. З пулемёту уїбало. Командирський, командирську башенку да, разъебало полностью, то есть римплекс наблюдать. The video just video just kind of goes on showing that this thing is you know hasn't been yet been taken out of action and it's still operational all right two more videos for you this one i wouldn't call this combat footage but I, we get a lot of questions and there's a lot of interest about the abrams the abrams has been spotted once again in ukraine specifically the m1a1 situational awareness and what's interesting about this though is the additional armor protection that was provided to it, the M19 uh, explosive reactive armor kits. Here's the footage. Keeping the sound off though. So down the side of it there are explosive reactive armor tiles. And contact one, no, I don't see any contact on, on there. I'm surprised we don't see any. But there's not. All right. That'll do it for that. Uh, that's going to do it for the, for the Ukraine section of the show. So we covered Israel tonight. We covered Ukraine. I always have one more video for you. You might want to stick around for this one because I'm going to be doing you a favor in helping you get ready for the wheelie serious wave that's coming just stand by we'll get there we covered ukraine tonight uh, a little bit of footage right i'm never going to be able to catch everything we covered israel uh, we talked about uh, syria we talked about strikes that iran took into iraq uh, we talked a little bit about the strikes that they took on pakistan against uh baluchistan um so we made our way around the globe a little bit but i appreciate you being here Thanks very much for it. I appreciate all of the generosity from you guys. Vlad, thank you for the $10. Uh, Professor Hubert J. Farnsworth, thank you for the twelve fifty six. Hey, Ronnie, I recently learned the most dangerous thing to a soldier is their own weapon weaponry due to their concussive boom, artillery, tank, fire, uh, etc. Apparently, it tears brain tissue, it, like concussions and TBIs. Yeah, absolutely. There are certain weapon systems in the U.S. Arm arsenal that... From a training perspective, you're only allotted a certain amount of rounds that you can fire before you know, it's considered dangerous to your brain. So, yeah. DC Williams for a $100, sir. Oh, my goodness. Thank you for that, sir. Um, ST, thank you very much for the $10. But I'm out of here. We're going to follow it up on the other side with uh, another stream. Uh, if you guys want to come hang out, we could chat a little bit more. That's cool. But I'd like, I'd like for you guys to know that the wheelie serious people that are out there are really making an argument for changing the Mark 19 qualification tables. 
I don't know where this is from. I don't know what they're hoping to do with it. But I do know that we need to start training for it. Good night. Here are some really serious people doing something that I can't describe and stay informed. Bye-bye. I, I, I don't want to leave yet because I've actually thought about this. I, I hold, Just pause for a second. I've, th- I've thought way too far into this on what specific weapon system would be the most appropriate to counter this. And I'm convinced that it's the Mark 19 and 40 millimeter. Here's the thing. Yes, you could use like a 240 or a 50 or something like that. The 50 would actually probably really damage their vehicles that they're operating from there. The 240, you know, if you have some good enfilade, but the 40 millimeter, you have the possibility of dismounting a few of them, even if you don't hit too close. So if these guys come all screaming down the hillside at you, I'm, I'm saying that we need to add this to the qualification table for the Mark 19 because... That's going to be the most effective. You might actually dismount a few of them without hitting them with the fragmentation. Just saying. That's all. I know there's some decision makers in chat. Let's make it happen. Alternative, uh, just go up any flight of stairs or like a curb. Bye-bye.